What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 113, and I'm the co-host of the show, Kyle Anslone, here today with Will Porter. Will, how you doing, buddy? Doing great. How you doing, Kyle? Good. Will, the, the show's been doing well because people have been giving us a lot of love lately on Twitter and Facebook and MeWe, hitting the share button and everything. So uh, really stoked about it, just seeing how many more like tweets and, and stuff we're getting out there and uh, y'all are taking the time to do that. So please keep that up. Me and Will really appreciate it and it really does help the show. Uh, we, we're posting the show quite a few places now video versions at YouTube and Odyssey. Uh, the show is hosted at the Libertarian Institute, so the full archive of the show is at libertarianinstitute.org slash Kyle. And the show is now appearing on the blog section at antiwar.com. And assuming those are the, you know, anti-war-based episodes, if, if we go off and I do a crypto episode, you probably won't find that one there, but most of them will be appearing there. And uh, Will, anything else? No, man, let's get, jump right into it. All right. Or I guess our sponsor mentioned our right. uh, Paloma Verde. PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Again, the URL now, PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Brand new website, same great high quality CBD products that me and Will have been uh, talking about the entire time we're doing the show. Again, yes. I really like the topicals, especially the sports cream. I've been using that one a lot lately. Uh, definitely better than any of the other like rub on pain relief uh, creams I've tried. It doesn't have the bad smell of some and it's not like extreme icy or hot. It's just like a little bit of a cooling lotion feel and then it relieves the pain pretty quickly. Will Bill, what what do you like from Paloma Verde? Yeah, as I've said before, I, my favorite I think is the the melatonin soft gels. They have a couple different soft gels with different formulations. I like the the melatonin one for helping me with insomnia. And they also I think I, my second favorite I think is the the oil tinctures. Those have the highest dose of CBD. So if you just want the the raw oil, that that's what you go with. So yeah, definitely check out uh, PalomaVerdeStore.com. They have a whole new awesome website. They got educational resources. They got lab results. And uh, use the promo code Peace to get a twenty percent off your order. All right, let's get into the show, Will. And uh, we we focused a lot of the show the past couple of weeks on what was happening in Gaza with the Israeli bombing campaign, really what was unfolding all over uh, Israeli controlled and occupied territory. You know, the, the things going on at the Alaska Mosque in East Jerusalem, uh, the attempted eviction of some neighborhoods in that area, and then, of course, the intense bombing of Gaza. And now we have something of a ceasefire going on, although, it, it, you know, it's not like it, we're not seeing Palestinians being rounded up in Israel and in the West Bank and some pretty brutal arrests going on. But at least the the rocket fire and the bombs being dropped on Gaza have stopped. Will so, uh, what what do you have updates on the ceasefire? What was agreed to, and uh, and, and what's the the situation now? Yeah, sure. And I do want to I do want to get to the ceasefire. I figured we could just give a few other updates just okay. to, before we yep. get into that, just to wrap up. So we covered most, I think, of the the major events that happened throughout the fighting of eleven days in Gaza. But just to sort of you know give some final updates to wrap up the situation. Um, I think all, like all said and done over this 11 days of, of conflict, I believe the final death toll was 248 Palestinians, including 66 children, as well as 12 Israelis, and two of those were children. And I believe most of these are, we are talking civilians. I think there was one Israeli soldier that was killed. Um, the Gaza Health Ministry says 2,000 people in Gaza were injured. Um, strangely, the World Health Organization, they have a way higher figure. There's is 8,500. I don't really know what explains the the discrepancy there, but needless to say, thousands of people were wounded in the the airstrikes, as well as I think like five at least 500 people in Israel. Um, now let's see. The UN says that uh, 52,000 people in Gaza were displaced, so you know people fleeing the airstrikes. A lot of them ended up at these UN uh, run schools, uh, using those as sort of makeshift shelters. Um, 500 buildings severely damaged in the Gaza Strip. Um, some of this we covered on previous shows, but the that included like high rise apartment blocks. Uh, media offices, uh, homes in a refugee camp, as well as uh, 30 health clinics and hospitals. Uh, the Israelis also bombed Gaza's main uh, uh, coronavirus testing site and vaccination site. Their their main COVID lab was totally shut down. Um, so a lot of damage for a territory that is under blockade. I mean, um, the, the Gazans often have a hard time importing like construction materials and things they need to rebuild. Um, so a lot of these buildings that were destroyed are just sort of gone for good now. The people who live there and work there are just kind of SOL because it's going to be very hard for them to re-import these uh, you know, building materials. Um, 
So I think that's what I've got basically in terms of the, the statistics and the, the sort of overall impact of the fighting. We did cover a lot of the other details in the background on the previous show um, or on previous shows. Uh, needless to say, there was a ton of death and destruction in Gaza and, and as well as uh, Israeli cities. Not quite as bad as what happened in 2014, what Israel called Operation Protective Edge, where like 2,000 civilians died. But that was 50, over 51 days rather than just 11. Um, so again, that's sort of just like the, the, you know, the postmortem of what happened in Gaza. It was a brutal 11 days of fighting. A lot of people died, but, um, to get into the ceasefire, um, I think it was Thursday night here in the West or uh, Friday morning in Gaza, they agreed to this deal to, you know, to cease fire. Uh, it was uh, mediated by the Egyptians. Uh, it's not totally uncommon for the Egyptians to come and sort of like send negotiators when there's issues between Hamas and the Israeli government. Um, there had been previous reports that the, the Egyptians were out there trying to negotiate earlier on, like just a few days into the fighting, but uh, it was reported that the Israelis rejected that. And I don't really know what changed between then and like a week later, but they did finally accept to, to stop fighting um, on Friday morning. So the deal took effect at like 2 a.m. Uh, that morning. It appears that it's been holding since it's been a few days and there hasn't been, I don't think, any, uh, you know, uh, serious unrest. I think there was it, like right after the ceasefire was announced, there were some reports of, you know, continued airstrikes. But after the deadline uh, at 2 a.m., I think that's basically stopped. Um, now, however, the Israelis, unfortunately, do seem to be doing a lot uh, to, to mess this thing up, like less than 24 hours after the ceasefire was reached and, and the fighting stopped, they sent in another riot squad into Al-Aqsa Al Mosque and, you know, shot, you know, shooting uh, rubber bullets and stun grenades into crowds of people. People will recall, as we explained on a previous show, that is what started this whole thing in the first place was one of these heavy handed, violent Israeli incursions, you know, into Al-Aqsa Mosque. That was it was after that that Hamas fired their first uh, their first volley of rockets. And um, fortunately, the 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 second, the later incursion did not draw any more rocket fire, but it just seems like judging by the behavior, the Israelis sort of wanted to, to you know, poke the tiger a little more. Um, now, in terms of the sort of American role in all of this, I mean, all throughout this thing in Gaza, the Biden administration was completely deferential to the Israelis, at least in all their public statements. Uh, they did everything they could to obstruct efforts at the UN to call for a ceasefire. I think there was four separate attempts to pass some kind of joint statement or resolution in the Security Council, and all of them were blocked by, by the United States. Uh, not that those statements really do much anyway, but like the U.S. wouldn't even tolerate this symbolic thing if it could be construed as critical of the Israelis. And I mean, in, even in announcing the ceasefire, um, you know, Biden made sure to repeat all the stuff about, you know, Israel's right to defend itself. He did pay some lip service to civilian deaths. Um, but he also made sure to say that we would be replenishing their uh, Iron Dome missile defense system, where you know each each interceptor missile costs you know tens of thousands of dollars. Some estimates put it closer to a hundred thousand per missile. But you know, sure, I guess we'll foot the bill for that. Um, and then even more ironic in that announcement, um, Biden is saying how we're going to help Gaza to rebuild because, like I'm saying, they're under blockade. They have a hard time importing uh, construction materials. But he said they would we would only give funds and aid to the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, not to Hamas. Because you know Hamas might use those to replenish their their crappy third world military arsenal, so we, Biden will straight up replenish Israeli defenses. He'll hand over this cash, no questions asked, on top of the four billion we already give them every year. Yet he refuses to give official bodies in Gaza aid on a vague suspicion that they might use that money for the same purpose. So I just think that's a good example of sort of how this always works, how one side of these things always are. Um, but. In terms of the, the updates in Gaza, I think that's basically what I had. Um, uh, the, the statistics of like, you know, the destruction, the death in Gaza, the impact on their, you know, their people, as well as the, the ceasefire itself and sort of the American role in that. Yeah, I, you know, thanks for all the information there, Will, because that, that's all really important because I think the people conversation that people are starting to have now is um like who who won from this or why did it happen and there's a lot of you know a lot of the, the more zionists are trying to point the finger at hamas and saying look hamas always wins they're getting what they wanted i'm not sure how hamas won here to me it seems like the the really the only victor was uh netanyahu in israel uh, I, I think one of the things to note here is just before this all happened, it was Netanyahu's rival. Uh, it was his uh, their ability, I guess, to start to try to form a coalition government uh, to to put somebody other than not Netanyahu in charge of you know the prime minister of Israel, and so it seems yeah. like he staved that off. I'm not quite sure what 
Hamas really got out of this. I mean, I'm I'm sure in some sense there's a, you know, maybe some more solidarity for Hamas uh, amongst the people of Palestine, uh, you know, whether they're in the West Bank, uh, in Israel, or in the you know in Gaza. Since th- this did kick off in a way, uh, uh, in defense of the the people who are being. Uh, harassed by Israeli riot squads at at the the mosque well so I don't know what what do you think who's winners losers uh, I mean obviously the losers are people anybody who died um and, and you know the people terrified and particularly the people of Gaza who you know on top of just the people who died the the destruction there is going to have long lasting impacts I doubt there's going to be that much Israeli infrastructure that won't be built if it was destroyed by uh, a Hamas rocket where anything that Israel de- uh, destroyed I I would guess won't be replaced or if it is it won't re- be replaced probably as nicely or in in an immediate time I mean, you know, the, the, those facilities are in immediate need a lot of times in Gaza. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there are still like structures and buildings and stuff that have still not been rebuilt from 2014 from that Israeli bombardment. So it is hard to say. It's hard to say who's the the winner in all this, but certainly the losers are the people of Gaza. I mean, I was happy to see uh, the night of the ceasefire when it took effect. There was these gigantic celebrations all throughout not only Gaza, but the West Bank and East Jerusalem as well. There was this big sort of like, you know, uh, cheering on the end of violence. That's good. However, it's very unfortunate just to think that like, okay, the the bombing campaign is over, but Gazans do just return to this like, you know, as people say, life in an open air prison under Israeli blockade where there's 50 percent unemployment, you know, just uh, terrible conditions there. The U.N. has called it uh, virtually uninhabitable, the Gaza Strip. And so uh, certainly the people there did not win. Um, I don't know how much it would help uh, Netanyahu and his own political uh, prospects. I mean, he's facing all kinds of corruption st- uh, stuff right now. He's failed, I think, in the last... Israel's had a crazy last couple of years, their politics. They've had like four different elections. Every single one of them, Net- Netanyahu struggled to to build a coalition. And in this case, he finally just lost the right to it. The president, uh, Rivlin, gave that right to, I think, Natali Bennett uh, to... to uh, form a coalition. And so I'm not sure how much this thing will help him. I know that the conflicts in Gaza have helped him before, but in this case, it just seems like people might just be finally sick of his crap and are not you know, rallying around him to protect the, the people of Israel or something. Now, there's also the consideration of Hamas. They also, they had an election coming up in, uh, two, uh, in, in May, their first one since 2006, uh, between, in, in any of the Palestinian uh, territories. But there's all kinds of issues going on that, with that right now. I know the PA, the Palestinian Authority, has put those on hold because there's a dispute with the Israelis over whether residents of Jerusalem will be able to vote. And in this case, I don't know, Hamas might come out of this looking sort of like the, you know, the tough defenders of, of the Palestinian people or something. This might have you know, earned them some support, but I, I can't say for a fact. I, I don't know if there's any clear-cut victors in this. Right. Yeah. And I guess it's it also how it plays out uh, going in the future here. Well, if you know, maybe Israel would actually had to have reformed some policies or something like that. It would have been a clear victory for the Palestinian people. Uh, Even if, you know, some people in Gaza ended up dying in the bombing campaign, let's say Israel just, you know, let Gaza operate as its own little country and like import goods. I mean, that would be huge, right? Like, you know, there are huge wins that they, you know, could potentially score that they obviously didn't hear. And it, it seems like this is one of those situations situations where uh, it's kind of a win for the Israeli state because the whole conflict is now going to go back on the burn, bat burner of politics. Um, it, you know, Israel is going to continue to, you know, inflict a lot of punishment on the people of Gaza that will, you know, excess deaths will happen, not quite at the rate of 240 or so a week, but it will happen. And so it, it seems like the, the people of Gaza are just going to be stuck with a much slower death um, than, you know, had the bombing campaign uh, kept going. And so I really can't see this in any way as a win for peace, which which some people are pointing out or really even, you know, a ceasefire. It's just more ratcheting down the, the you know, kind of conflict that the, the Israelis and the Palestinians are in uh, since it's a, you know, a prison situation for Gaza and a military occupation for the West Bank and the rest of the Palestinians. 
That's right. Yeah. I mean, like, unfortunately, none of the underlying issues have changed here. There is still the blockade on Gaza. These evictions looming for, uh, in East Jerusalem are still uh, moving ahead. I think the, the ruling is sort of like in a standstill right now, but they haven't dropped that. And the settlements, the land theft, all that stuff is still continuing in the West Bank. So all this, all the same dynamics that give rise to these periodic eruptions of violence, uh, usually uh, manifesting in Gaza, uh, nothing has changed. It's all just, you know, it's the, the fighting may have died down, but certainly this kind of thing is going to happen again, unfortunately. Now, one, one thing, Will, that I, I thought was a positive is I think the needle moved a little bit in the U.S., at least among the, you know, squad type Democrats on this. They're, they're willing to stand up. And I think to some sense they've now tied it to some other social justice movements like Black Lives Matter. And, and so I, I do think that this may get more recognition. And I, I feel like it's a little bit harder to just make the, the racist claims now because you, you can't call Alan Omar a racist for supporting Muslims. That, like that's something that you're not allowed to do. And so if that applies when Mitt Romney's doing it, it also applies when Chuck Schumer's doing it, right? Like the or Nancy Pelosi. So uh, in some way, I think uh, there, there's been some disarming of the like anti-Semitic uh, narrative and trope that kind of goes around towards anybody who, you know, supports the Palestinians just being able to like have a future. And, you know, I would like for them to be able like if another country wants to do business with, you know, the people of Gaza so they could like have some capital and build some stuff and that like, you know, what was it? 50 percent of the population is under the age of 18 and there's 50 percent unemployment there. I mean, those two numbers alone, like that's a no future kind of situation. So we have to find some way to change that for those people. Yeah. And man, the anti-Semitism stuff is so dumb. Like in, in this country, it's so many of the leading activists against, you know, the, the military occupation, and the land theft are Jewish, are, you know, a lot of college activist group, Jewish Voice for Peace, independent Jewish voices. There's a bunch of different ones that, you know, are leading sort of the it's, it's them and Palestinians as well. But like in the BDS movement, for example, it's it's many Jewish people pushing that as well. So I don't know. I guess you could pull out the old like self-hating trope thing, but that's just it's outrageous. Right. Yeah, um, I mean, and then Sheldon Richmond, uh, you know, at the Libertarian Institute has written his great book. Uh, yeah. But it, the the narrative still exists because uh, apparently there's that AP writer who uh, is believed to now have been fired for her activism in college for in groups like Students for Palestine and stuff like that. So I'm really hoping that we get more information on that story. Um, I, I see some journalists out there, like actually, I think trying to dig into why the AP made the decision for sure. Like I, I don't think it's like absolutely conclusive that that's why she was fired, but it, it seems to be the case. And so, yeah. you know, we still have a lot of fighting to do on this uh, on this narrative because, you know, if, you, if you're risking your job to stand up for Palestine, then a lot of people aren't going to do it. And you kind of understand because as, as terrible as it is that there's some guy in Gaza that can't feed his kids you know are you going to take food off of your kids table to make that happen that's a that's a tough choice to have to make so and, yeah. and you know it's important we gotta still disarm that anything else will no man i think that's all i had for for gaza um certainly if anything continues to happen there we will we'll bring it up but i think that basically wraps up the the coverage of this this conflict this last 11 day eruption of violence there all right let's move on here will and uh i think we're going to talk about some uh legislation on uh on AUMFs in Congress. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. So we have uh, several bills in Congress, and uh, you know, I'm not sure how much chance there are that any of these bills will or can get passed, but I think it's worth talking about them and then what Congress is willing to look at and what it seems like they're unwilling to look at will. So the main article I have here is Congress moves uh, to revoke Eisenhower's blank check for Middle East wars uh, by Matthew Petty at Responsible Statecraft. And the way he's really talking about in here is the 1950 seven authorization for use of military force that was passed and i believe this one said that it's uh, uh allows the u.s to carry out anti-communist operations in the middle east and of course <laughs> yeah. 30 years ago the soviet union fell and that kind of ceased to be the concern of uh you know the the 
what's going on in the Middle East. Well, I'm not sure if I would say there's any real communist governments in the Middle East at this point. And if there is, the U.S. is supporting them in southern Yemen. Um, those are really like kind of the only communists I could find everybody else. I, I mean, it, it's, it's just authoritarian government. It, you know, Kings aren't, are kind of socialists, but they're not socialists. Um, right. so it, that should definitely be repealed. And it seems like that would be an easy thing for Congress to do and then claim that they did something really important, which is it, probably not all that important. Cause I don't think that gets cited very often, but um, it, it, you know, in case they ever want to do something crazy, like start bombing Southern Yemen for some reason, I guess this would be something that they could cite and say, oh, we have the legal justification to do this. Now, there's also a couple other uh, bills that could be repealed that are probably uh, more important. And the first one is the uh, 1991 authorization for use of military force that was used uh, for the first uh, Gulf War. And while I haven't heard that one cited very recently, Will, I, I I mean, it is more recent. We do have troops in Iraq. I'm sure they, you know, there there are like Husseins in Iraq. And so maybe, you, you know, there's some legal justification they could scrap that into. And so it is very important to get that, that you know, legal thing off the books as, you know, you can't use force for this. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's unlikely to be used. The one that has been used is the 2002 uh, authorization for use of military force, which is George Bush's uh, Iraq War bill. And that one, I, I think, would actually be important to repeal. But, well, anything else on uh, these three uh, uh, resolutions here? Yeah, I do find it interesting that, like, the, the 1991 bill, um, that was passed after H.W. Bush sent, like, 500,000 troops into Saudi and into other countries around the Persian Gulf. So it is kind of funny how they'll just kind of do whatever they want anyway. But then, you know, I guess they, they waited around for that that uh, 91 to, to finally actually send those those troops into Kuwait to expel the Iraqis from there. Um but no, um, I'm curious about, uh, I think you said there were some bills to, to repeal those. Um, uh, can you tell us any more about those? I think one was sponsored by Barbara Lee. Uh, there's another by, uh, I think, Tim Kaine. Is it mostly Democrats uh, pushing these to, to repeal these AUMFs? It, it seems to be a lot of Democrats as the sponsors, but there are Republicans on board. I saw uh, a Justin Amos's, uh replacement in Congress. What is his name? Peter Mayer. Is that yeah, how you Peter say Meyer. his last Meyer. Uh, so, yeah. He was on board with the uh, nineteen or uh, the nineteen fifty seven one. Uh, you highlight Barbara Lee, who's of course good on all of these, and I'm sure a co sponsor on every bill. Uh, yeah. Tim Kaine, in fact, was making uh, some statements saying that he thought that there was good momentum involved uh, to repeal uh, both the nineteen ninety one and the two thousand two. I'm not sure why he didn't include the 1957 in those statements. Maybe it's just because he kind of sees it as irrelevant or that's more something being taken up at the House at this point, uh, but that there is movement on it. Now, Will, I, I got to say, even if these bills start to move forward, I don't know it's if it's going to be a great thing because – the you know anti-war movement has to keep pressure on congress to make sure that these are not repeal and replace because that yes. would be even worse to modernize the 2002 uh aumf that's kind of outdated like it it, it would sound stupid if they used any of these things for a current airstrike right like people would be like come on that that's kind of ridiculous it seems well they like did I, right, I was going to mention, do. They, they did use the, for Soleimani, the 2002 one, but people did kind of roll their eyes and go, you're right. kidding me, really? Two, right. 2002 AUMF for Soleimani, which is what, 2019 or 2020? Right. And so I'm sure that, and I'm sure that if they wrote a new one, they would use some very vague language to make that, uh, to make a new one even worse. But also, Will, this doesn't target the heart of the current you know, just a legal justification that the president uses for endless war. And that's the 2001 authorization for use of military force. I said, you know, yes. you could you could go kill Al Qaeda, Osama bin Laden and the Taliban. And somehow that has meant you could go after Assad and Gaddafi and the Houthis and just about everyone else anywhere from at least Mali to the Philippines. Wait, I think it's 14 countries they've used that in. Countries. That, that one single AUMF. 
Yes, at least. I think they may have actually operated in, like, operations, but, like, kinetic military operations in 14 countries with that single thing. Uh, And and so that's the one that if Congress was serious about taking back their war powers that they would repeal. Now, look, if they start with 1957 because it's easy and because how can you really argue with that? You know, if some town has a law that says, like, women can't vote on Wednesdays, like, nobody should have trouble repealing that. Uh, a war authorization from 1957 nobody should object to repealing that and, and so if you guys start there and then you guys say well you know 1991 was uh you know 30 years ago now so that kind of made sense too and then you know you use that and you're like well that one was george bush's so does anybody want to defend i know his reputations being rehabilitated but come on do we really want to like continue george bush's war and if that's all you gotta do and then you get to 2001 fine but you actually that's the one congress needs to understand that that's the one that really matters yeah yeah that's the really dangerous one that's the one where even though it doesn't even say this in the text of the thing they the the dod takes it to mean uh, al-qaeda and associated forces Meaning, like anybody you can you can hypothetically link to Al Qaeda, you can associate them together. It's just this gigantic open-ended thing, and that makes sense that they've invoked it so many times to invoke, you know, to justify military action in country after country, far flung from Afghanistan, have nothing to do with, uh, you know, Al Qaeda as we know it, you know. Right, right, yeah. That's I, one of the most abthir- absurd things about this is everybody knew that this was to get. Osama bin Laden, who yeah. never left. I, I mean, he left Afghanistan, but only to go to Pakistan, the country in that store. He yeah. never, you know, got across Iran to Iraq or Syria or any of these other countries that we've invaded. And yet they've, you know, been able to stretch and distort that. You know, I, I saw once that like Barbara Lee and Justin Amash had a uh, committee hearing where they had people come up and say, like, look, you know, Congress, you should have learned your lesson on uh, these kind of authorizations and anything in the future needs to be location specific. You have to like say, what kind are you authorizing, you know, military force drone strikes, you know, to just say that like you could do something didn't uh, like people when they passed the 2002 authorization for use of military force or say this would help get inspectors in that country. Well, they used it for war. So you have to be very specific for what you're authorizing in these things. And um, at, at this point, at least maybe well, like they would be interested in like putting amendments on it uh to say like hey you know in in five years this this thing's gonna sunset maybe that would be you know something the american people would be in support of but you gotta start to rein this in somehow uh from the congressional end and and they've been completely negligent on it for at least 20 years now yeah yeah i mean barbara lee seems to be you know one of the few that has been pushing a little harder against it but she's a lone you know voice in that for sure. Right. But I guess it is good to see this like flurry of bills that there's there's quite a few now that are pushing to repeal these. And I hope that becomes more and more sort of the trend that they decide these are just outrageous. Look how they use them. I mean, they didn't even go. They took them. It took them over 10 years to get bin Laden. They waged a completely separate war against like the people of Afghanistan, all justified under that AUMF. So. Right. And it's a real shame, Will, that more uh, of the like Democrat members that like the squad members that, you know, were finally saying something uh, about Palestine aren't making a bigger deal about this. You, you know, they, they want all this money to pay for all these absurd programs. And people are like, well, how are you going to pay for it? They'd be like, well, I'm going to start ending wars. And that would be <laughs> a, a real thing. And people would be like, oh, wow, like at least they're saying something. They're not just like, we're going to tax more people and the country's going to run massive deficits and debts. And you're going to tax more people to pay for trillions and more spending. Come on. Oh, you're going to cut the budget where we're having needless, endless wars. Okay. That made sense. So right. we haven't heard maybe that you get very some, much. Some conservatives to agree maybe too about that, you know, get some of this budget stuff in line. Maybe right. not the other spending, but some of the cuts maybe. Right. Oh, well, that's something I forgot to ask you and I've been looking for. I didn't see a single Republican have a single elected Republican have a decent take on the Israel Palestine thing. I, I think Justin Amash did, although I think that, you know, I he's like a personal family connection, I think, to Palestine. But yeah. other than that, I didn't see anyone who you could even remotely consider a Republican issue anything positive on that. 
Yeah, I, I admittedly didn't go around looking too hard. Like, I don't follow re- too many Republicans too closely. But no, I did not just see I didn't see any actual statements or any, you know, outwardly good things on that at all. A lot of them are terrible on it or like Amash, I think, is probably one of the best. But even he, I'm not sure how how much I agree with his take on it. Right. Uh, I saw the House Freedom Caucus, which is usually the best on war were so loud on Israel. Like every one had like a, I stand with Israel, like little pose and statement outside. And they they were all in on that. But will, uh, should we move on here and talk about Yemen? Yeah, let's do it, man. It's been too long since we talked about Yemen on the show. Uh, and, and in one way, I guess that's just because the suffering continues where are we yeah. supposed to say, we're not sure how many, but more people starved to death this week. Biden still won't end, uh, the support that, you know, Saudis need to wage their air war. He won't demand they end the blockade. And so things are just getting worse, but we have, uh, some actual news updates to get to today too. So, Will, what's, uh, what's actually happening? Yeah, a couple of things I think have happened the last couple of weeks that, that make a Yemen update uh, something we should do. Um, and as we've explained on previous shows, I'll just kind of recap um, sort of where things stand now. Um, they're kind of at a stalemate, actually, which makes it even harder to, to cover this. There's not that much new to say other than, like you said, a couple more people died, more people starved to death. Terrible. Um, the Houthis, though, are still driving this offensive into Marib which is sort of the last like major piece of territory that the Saudi backed side controls in the northern part of Yemen. It's like 80 miles or so east of the capital of Sana'a. And uh, that offensive has been going on for months now though. I think the Houthis launched it back in February and they're kind of at a standstill. Um, depending on who you know who you read, I think if you read like you know certain uh, Arab media that's citing Saudi sources, they'll often you know say that the Houthis are doing really bad. If you if you read media that's citing more uh, Houthi aligned sources, they say oh we're striking victories every day against the you know the the Saudi uh, regime. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell exactly what the what the score is there, but it seems like relatively it's at a standstill. Not a lot of territory is being taken um, uh, since February at least. Uh, There has been some talk about a potential ceasefire. Uh, The Saudis have said they're open to that. However, they refuse to lift their naval blockade on Yemeni ports, which is the Houthis' major demand and has been their major demand for quite a long time now. They're saying that until that happens, they will continue their push into Marib, which is a a fairly like resource rich, oil rich uh, uh, area, I think. Um, Now, Biden's people uh, in the U.S. administration are, of course, aware of the Houthis' demand and they are aware of the issue of the blockade. I think they've disputed whether to call it a blockade before, but they acknowledge there are restrictions on Yemeni ports, uh, but they continue to place pretty much all blame on the Houthis. Uh, And in fact, just last Thursday, the administration uh, slapped sanctions actually on two senior Houthi uh, military people who are leading the Marib offensive and kind of like, you know, blaming them for the the continued fighting. Um, Now, Biden's Yemen envoy did recently urge the Saudis to lift their restrictions on Yemeni ports. So, again, they know that this is a thing. They know that this is like an outstanding issue. However, you'll you'll notice that the sanctions are only ever used on the one side. Like they will not sanction Saudi officials to get them to to lift the blockade um, or really do anything that might actually pressure them to change their behavior. Um, Like as we've covered on the show, Biden did call off a couple weapons deals when he first took office. But um, we've also discussed this. They continue to give them all the help that matters, uh, including uh, aircraft maintenance, which is like a key thing in the Saudi war effort. Um, there seems to be a you know pretty clear pattern to all this. Like you see that with the Israelis as well. We get extremely close with these like terrible regimes. Uh, we back them to the hilt with all this money and all these all these weapons. But then even when we say we want them to do something or stop doing something, we won't actually pull back that support. It's all just kind of for show and for lip service. Like when Biden, you know, laments the, the, you know, the violence in Yemen and says he wants it to stop. It doesn't seem like he means it because he's not doing all he could to stop it. You know, uh, as, as we mentioned, I think the Saudis could only fly like two out of 10 of their warplanes without this uh, American maintenance. Um, uh, however, uh, sort of similar to the, the AUMF issue, some American lawmakers are actually starting to come around on this issue. Um, last week, we had a group of uh, I think it was all Democratic senators uh, sending a letter to Biden urging him to do what I was just talking about, to actually pressure the Saudis to, to lift the blockade and to stop, you know, uh, the, the bombing campaign, uh, which has killed, you know, like tens and tens of thousands of people bombing on civilian areas. Every kind of civilian structure has been hit, farms and factories and hospitals and schools and everything. Um, and so, you know, as much as I despise Elizabeth Warren, I don't think she's that, that great of a person. She does, I think, deserve some credit for doing this. She was like the main organizer of this letter. And they, they cite the UN's forecast that 400,000 children in Yemen could die, could starve to death under a looming famine if the conditions there don't change. 
Uh, they pointed out Saudi's history of bombing farms and all those civilian structures I just mentioned all throughout the war for six years straight. Um, so I don't know, the letter was pretty good. Um, and then we've also had Senator Chris Murphy has been uh, talking about this a lot as well. Um, I don't always agree with the stuff he says. I think he's a little bit too, he buys into this narrative that Iran like controls and, and owns the Houthis. Um, but he has also been calling on Saudi to lift their blockade. And he actually just went on this big like uh, trip through the Middle East a few weeks ago uh, where he had all these meetings about Yemen. So it seems like he is like, you know, trying to do something, trying to make something happen there as well. Um, so it's been this very long process over six years, but it does seem that a handful of senators and representatives are finally starting to get better on this issue. And they are saying some of the right things, at least. You know, it's hard to be optimistic after six years of this and not seeing really much change. But I don't know, I guess at some point, uh, you know, it is good to see some of these lawmakers come around. Right. Well, you know, I, the worst part about it, Will, is, uh, you know, me and you have known about for six years and hell, we've been podcasting about it for four years now. Right. Uh, yep. We realized that we've uh, been recording episodes together for four years now this past week. Uh, yep. and, and that's what makes it so frustrating is, you know, Chris Murphy and Elizabeth Warren could have stopped it when they, you know, under Obama or under Trump, it would have been easier to rally support. And even yep. now, you know, what they're doing while the, you know, it is a strong letter, it isn't a, it, it, it doesn't immediately help and it's not the same as introducing a bill and yeah. you know trying to whip all the democrats on board and saying we have to pass this and let's see our own president veto our own bill uh right. you know because they they were able to pass a a a, a, a war authorization or are blocking the u.s war in yemen under trump he vetoed it all right let's see biden veto that like put make him face the same uh situation and so far they haven't done that it seems like biden's goal really is to keep congress just appeased enough that they don't pass a resolution that he'll have to veto uh yeah. but at the same time you know, continue to support Saudi Arabia in this war. Well, one thing I, I want to kind of talk about, and I thought uh, would be interesting with how much we've covered Gaza recently, and I think one real similar uh, similarity to what's happening in, in Yemen is you essentially have a besieged group. Uh, the, you know, the Houthis in northern Yemen and Hamas or the, you know, though that that's not the BC, the people of northern Yemen are besieged with the Houthi being the, the controlling government faction there that provide services. It's not like they're just a militant group like they do oh. run and have maintained some kind of government for six years. I feel like you yeah. have a very similar situation with Hamas and Gaza. They both start with an H. Iran is vaguely sympathetic to both movements, and that has been enough to really generate a narrative in the American media that these groups are the problem, that they're the enemy. Uh, in, in a way, I feel like the kind of maybe the proportions different. The Houthi have larger missiles. They're they're not rockets, but they're largely unguided, although they have fired some drones and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. But they're not necessarily the same high-tech weapons that the Saudis have. The Saudis have missile defense systems to shoot some of it down. And while the Houthi attacks could also be described as indiscriminate, uh, the, the Saudis have, you know, American precision-guided bombs and have, you know, bombed far more civilian targets just like Israel has than Hamas or the Houthis have hit in either Saudi Arabia or Yemen. And, and so I just think the comparison there is so interesting in how you have to condemn the Houthis and Hamas or else you're supporting terrorism. But it, when you look at the situation, it, you know, these are both two groups that are, you know, they're, they're militant organizations that essentially represent groups of people that are going to die if they just peacefully protest. So. Yeah. I mean, Scott Horton had a great line in one of his speeches the other day, and it's like you walk into a room and you see a fist fight going on. You don't know who started that fist fight. So you can't just point at one guy and say he's the aggressor because you saw him punch the other guy. That seems to be a lot of like, uh, you know, American, just average Americans take. They look at the TV and see, oh my God, Hamas rockets or Houthi attacks on Saudi oil infrastructure. And, oh, they're the aggressors. But, like, you can't just l walk in, in the middle of a fist fight and, and, and know that. You know, you have to kind of know a little bit about the situation and the conflict. How did this start? And when you start looking into that, you start seeing that, oh, maybe these people, you know, the Houthis, Hamas, even Hezbollah, the things these guys do aren't always justified. They do 
do terrible things. They kill innocent people sometimes. But just looking at the overall balance of power and who is the overall aggressor, who is responding to what, it's pretty clear who, you know, in in most of these cases, in the, the Israel-Palestine, the Israel-Lebanon issue, and the Saudi and Yemen issue, it's very clear to see who is the overall aggressor, who is supported by the world superpower as well. Right. And I, I think you also have, uh, again, the issue, Will, with uh, the, the status quo is aggression against these groups. And we've seen in Yemen when people have, you know, tens of thousands at a time peacefully protest in Sana'a. Saudi Arabia has dropped bombs near the protest or has like flown F-16s over those protests, producing sonic booms that are, you know, they're, they're terrifying and uh, like psychologically torturing and tormenting peaceful protesters. And in, in the situation in Gaza, we saw in what was that, 20. 18 or 19 with the great march of return where they yeah, went yeah. to the fence and were just mowed down by Israeli sniper rifles. I mean, there's documented cases of children not facing the, the fence that separates Gaza from Israel, a hundred, 150 meters from that sh- fence being shot in the back or the side of the head, like yeah. things that can't be justified in any way happening during a peaceful protest. You know, I, I'm not always a big fan of it. I think it's oversighted. You know, if you don't allow peaceful protests, as violence is going to be the result but when you're actually like when when people are facing the situation of you know can i feed my children or do i have to like you know take another child to get medicine like which one can i afford this month i I think those people are legitimately in a position where if they if there's no violence at all, then they're just going to slowly be killed. And so, you know, the, there is constant, you know, people like to talk about property rights and violations of the non-aggression people. There's active violations of the non-aggression p- principle against the people of Gaza and the people who live in northern Yemen. And so, right. at, you know, short of tats that I, I think deliberately target civilians. Like if you pull like a, a suicide bombing on a crowded market, if you, yeah. you know, launch rockets at a market. Now I, I think indiscriminate rocket attacks are a little bit different than directly targeting civilian targets. I, I think if you know, you're firing rockets in the general direction of an Israeli military installation, but your rockets don't have the real ability to target it. I, I mean, you right. have to be able to fight bad somehow. I, I don't know if I could really condemn that, but certainly any attacks that directly are, you know, if you're just shooting a rocket at an apartment building, that's that's wrong, right? But, yeah. you know, if, if the Houthis are firing towards a, a Saudi base and it hits a civilian target, I, I mean, I feel like that's more on the Saudis for the Houthis not having any other way to fight back against their children starving to death than anything else. Right, it's blowback. Yep. All right, right well... Yeah. Uh, anything else? Uh, I think that was it for Yemen. All right. Uh, I think that about covers what we have today. Um, great show again, Will. I really enjoyed it. We'll be back with more this week. Uh, check out PalomaVerdeCBD.com. That's PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Use the promo code PEACE, P-E-A-C-E. That gets you 25% off at checkout when you spend $75 or more. Be sure to subscribe to the show somewhere, YouTube, Odyssey, your favorite uh, you know, audio podcast app. Uh, then like, share, subscribe from Facebook, MeWe, and Twitter. Donate, Patreon, or Subscribestar. Will, thanks again, buddy. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, everybody. See ya.